Allow me now at this time to present uh, our lecturer. Uh, Dr. Paul N. Anderson is professor of biblical and Quaker studies at George Fox University. And he is extraordinary professor of religion at the Northwest University of Pashishroom, South Africa. And presently, he's serving as visiting Grissett Professor of Bible and Christian Tradition at Chapman uh, University. He is a prolific uh, writer, uh, author of over 200 published essays, and author and editor of uh, a dozen books. Uh, one of those books I actually used in my class, The Riddles of the, the Fourth Gospel. Uh, he received his PhD from Glasgow University, served as visiting professor at the Rabu University of Nivigen and the Gutenberg University of Mainz, Princeton Theological Seminary, and Yale Divinity School. He edited Quaker Religious Thought and Evangelical Friend, and he is the New Testament editor of the Biblical Interpretation Series by E.J. Brill. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to present Dr. Anderson to you. <laughs> Thanks, Kenneth. Right, it's good to be with you again here at Azusa Pacific and uh, see uh, Gary Railsbeck and uh, John, good to be with you again. Uh, George Fox University has a lot in common with Azusa Pacific, uh, very similar mission, uh, even some uh, historical connection with some of the groups that have founded the different institutions. Hello, Bill. Great to see you. Wonderful. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's really great to be here with you and uh, to also then uh, participate in your inauguration of the St. John's Bible. Um, we are in our second year with the St. John's Bible. Uh, we haven't uh, quite identified a donor who's going to, you know, fund the whole project or a set of donors who are going to help with uh, yeah, maybe funding individual volumes, but we hope that some of that will happen by the end of the year. Uh, it's been my privilege to steward uh, the first two years with the St. John's Bible, and the volumes that we've had are the same as the ones that, that you've had here. Uh, volume 1, which is Pentateuch, and Volume 6, which is Gospels and Acts. So you can imagine my delight uh, to be able to go and actually leaf through the pages of some of the other volumes. This is the first time I also have seen uh, all seven volumes together. Uh, first time I've seen five of them at all uh, in, 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 in you know, first-hand experience. Um, something that you might also think about is making um, the different images available for, for teaching. Uh, as has happened in some of your courses already, uh, I've drawn in some of the images uh, into my introduction to Bible classes. There's more that I can do, uh, but also given that you have the full set here, um, you know, if faculty you know, would think about how to use some of these images in introducing the Bible, well, that could make some contacts with the library then in terms of such a great resource here on campus. Well, uh, thank you for the fine introduction. Uh, that really you know, sets uh, the stage for what the St. John's Bible, uh, how it came together. Um, Donald Jackson uh, was the founder of the idea, uh, the founder of, of the project. Here, um, the butterflies, the monarch butterflies, uh, that artist is an artist with the Smithsonian, uh, one of the leading nature artists. And if you think of, uh, and, and the place of this painting, uh, is at the end of the Gospel of Mark. Now, the Gospel of Mark uh, has a later addition uh, to it, which talks about the resurrection and the appearances of Jesus. Um, th think about the monarch butterfly and the associations with the resurrection. Uh, you have a caterpillar, a chrysalis, and then metamorphosis. And so thinking about an Easter theme, well, how about monarch butterfly? And, and also, um, given that St. John's is in Minnesota, um, what if, it, uh, um, heaven forbid, what if a century from now we have no more butterflies? Well, this also documents you know, a 21st century reality uh, that we hope continues into further generations. Um, so, uh, illuminating the Word of God um, um, is a part of the theme also of the St. John's Bible. Illumination means that they've used gold and platinum. Uh, silver, uh, of course, corrodes a bit, 
but platinum will continue on as ways of symbolizing the divine presence. So as you look through the volumes, what you'll see is that each of the 160 images has some gold that's been applied by hand. If you think of just the work of doing that for 299 volumes, okay, copies, exact representations of the original, uh, of seven volumes, um, that's a huge amount of work. And all the volumes are finished by hand, uh, sewn together, so like three sheets are folded in half and bound in the spine, the middle. Uh, and so then they are, are bound together. Um, you can actually, you know, uh, learn something about bookmaking in just looking at the ways that each of the volumes were put together. Um, notice that the artists are using quill. Uh, Here is, is, is a, a goose feather quill. And that's the way the monks did in, in uh, centuries of old. Um, and, and they would sharpen the quill with what? A pen knife. That's why it's called a pen knife, to sharpen your quill, okay? And, and actually, uh, the quill is very pliable, uh, kind of like the human fingernail, and therefore, um, the artist has, has a great deal of flexibility, more so than with our metal pens that we have today, um, to, to actually you know, make the letters exactly the way the artist or the calligrapher is wanting to happen. Also, the India ink uh, is a special kind of ink, and Donald Jackson tells the story, uh, that is from the 19th century China ink, and um, it, it was a very rare um, kind of ink, and, and it, it's no longer available. He had been buying this up at an artist's store in London and then giving out um, you know, little um, uh, uh, pieces of black ink to be crushed and made in, 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 into the ink. Uh, he had been giving these away as gifts and presents, um, but then when the, when the project came along, he realized, oh my goodness, um, there's limited supply. And so he began asking those gifts back. And the story is that they had exactly enough. Um, they had like one stick left over by the end of the project. So six or seven calligraphers then um, did the different pages. Uh, they were sent by Federal Express uh, in folios. Uh, to the different artists and then calligraphers around the world, and that's the way that they uh, completed their project over 11 years. Um, the first volume done was volume six. The second volume that they did was uh, volume one, and they proceeded uh, in a slightly different order uh, along the way. So uh, one of the things that, that I've done uh, in Newburgh, Oregon, in the greater Newburgh area, uh, is to uh, d do a display uh, a couple of Christmases ago uh, at our cultural center. Um, uh, one of its directors is one of our former students, and she was saying, oh, we don't have any, we, uh, our, our Christmas display fell through, the artist wasn't able to come. And so I was talking with her, and I said, well, uh, would you like to have the St. John's Bible for a Christmas display? She said, great. So, so we did an illumination of the birth of Christ. and. Uh, and so people from, from culture, you know, um, not necessarily Christians, uh, came in and, and, and observed uh, you know, just the beauty of the artwork. And it, 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 it really does allow us to engage culture with amazing artwork and historic themes and images uh, that create some outreach that would not be possible otherwise. Well, here's Donald Jackson. Um, this is the frontispiece of the Book of Matthew. And so this is the first uh, full page that was done in the project. Um, if you compare this image, uh, which is also available online, just go to the St. John's website. Um, if you compare this image with um, the first page of volume six out there in the foyer, um, you'll see that, um, that it hasn't even been finished yet. Even some of the artwork uh, is still in process here. Uh, well, um, what happens if you make a mistake? Um, if it's just like one letter or a word, then the calligrapher can take the pen knife and actually scrape the ink off of the vellum, and the vellum that, which is leather, um, yearling calfskin. Uh, it's strong enough that, that you can actually, you know, <clears throat> make some repairs. What do you do, though, if you leave out an entire line? And what do you do if there is artwork on the page also and the artist has already done a masterpiece, okay? 
Well, um, they have continued on with some of the traditional ways of correcting errors. Uh, so how about if you bring in um, a bumblebee to actually pull a banner up on a pulley system and add it to an appropriate site? Or how about a lemur to help? Or how about if a bird flies in a line? We'll see this bird image when we look at the Gospel of Mark on the chapter 5 of Mark page. Um, beginning then with Hebrew scripture. Um, this is the frontispiece, uh, as in the, the first page, a full artistic uh, contribution of um, Genesis 1. Now let me just ask you to notice, um, what are the things that you see here? There's chaos, tohu rabohu, formless and void, just like my desk. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, sections, so the seven days, right? Uh huh. Um, you can see um, the, the light and darkness. Um, then you can see the dividing of the waters and the land. Um, the green image there on, on day three, uh, that's ask, actually the Ganges River in India um, and the delta there. Um, the sun and the moon. Um, you have a raven hovering over the waters, okay, which is uh, an ancient image of the Spirit of God. Um, you have the sea creatures, um, both the fish, and then you have, you know, also kind of a bit of fossilized record. Then you have creatures. Um, notice that the human creatures um, resembles um, prehistoric cave art. And, and so, you know, trying to draw in archaeology and ways that we might think about ancient cultures. Um, the seventh day is, is pure gold. And you can see this more closely when you look at volume one, but um, the gold squares symbolize the divine presence. And you can see the ways that they grow up until day seven. And so the divine presence is described as being fuller and fuller all the way up to the seventh day on which God rests, inviting us also to join in on Sabbath rest and to build that into our lives. Um, you also have intertextuality, um, uh, maybe inter-iconology, if you want to use icon as a, the Greek word for image. Um, so you have the new creation in Paul's writings, and notice the way the seven days are also portrayed there as a reminder of the first creation. Uh, again, formless and void. Um, describing the chaos out of which God created order. We can get into a bit of a reflection here about the importance of God creating order out of his word alone. Um, thinking about what that would mean to ancient cultures. Uh, in ancient cultures where you have myths of domination, where the Babylonian god Marduk creates order by murder and force, killing the goddess Tiamat out of her corpse making the dry land, and she's, she's a, a goddess of the waters. Um, the God of the Hebrews creates order by his word, not by violence or domination. Think about that as the literal meaning of the seven days of creation. Yeah, And think about its relevance for later generations as well. So again, you, you have um, uh, presentations of the seven days and their significance as it relates to um, uh, all humanity. Uh, as I mentioned, notice the increase of illumination and the increase of divine presence unto the seventh day. So if God got all of his work done in six days so that he could rest on the Sabbath, how about us? <laughs> Again, think about the meaning. Um, the meaning is literally How's that Sabbath rest coming along, you guys? Or if, if you look at um, the Ten Commandments, uh, the Ten Commandments on Sabbath, 
harkens back to God's creative work. And so, you know, sometimes in our, in our modern era, uh, we miss some of the foundational literal meanings of biblical texts, which um, the artwork helps us appreciate. Well, moving on to the second creation narrative. And when you look at volume one, you'll see that um, 1, 1 to 2, to 2, 4, A is all blue, and then we have 2, 4, B beginning a new section. Um, so in the Garden of Eden, you have the creation of Adam and Eve. Um, you have um, the serpent uh, who uh, creates uh, temptation and introduces uh, an occasion for the fall. If you look at the beauty of the, uh, of the garden, um, notice again that here in this image, we have different artists, a beautiful macaw. Uh, the snake is the most beautiful of snakes, the coral snake, but also one of the most poisonous. Um, here you have harlequin shrimp, which is uh, also a poisonous animal. So you have both beauty and also danger. Um, ancient human is also uh, portrayed as uh, an aboriginal hunter um, that might even be a female hunter to show that it's not just men uh, who did that providing work. Uh, then you have in Adam and Eve, um, you have um, presentation of an, of an original couple uh, that, that is very much not like a Western European presentation and yet connecting us with our ancestral heritage, maybe going back genealogically, you know, back to Africa or Ethiopia. Um, again, these images of cave dwelling art are used as a way of kind of privileging a bit of archeology span and the first humans. Uh, how about Jubal and Tubal Cain? And how about, uh, you know, instruments and uh, tools and different roles of people? Um, here's, as, as I mentioned, the harlequin shrimp and poisonous creatures. Um, the sea creatures uh, also are mentioned there. And lo and behold, how about throwing in a bit of fossil record uh, to, to bring a bit of archaeological and geological uh, witness to God's creative work. So God created humankind in his image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And um, in that sense, encompassing all of humanity in the creation of Adam and Eve. And notice that humans are created good in the divine image, and that precedes the fall. Real though it be, humans are also created first good in the divine image. Well, uh, there was a young man, uh, African-American, uh, looking at this image uh, in a museum, and uh, tears uh, uh, welled up in his eyes. And uh, the person managing the display said, well, um, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? And looking at this presentation of Adam and Eve, he said, I've never seen myself in the Bible before. Isn't that amazing? And so sometimes j just looking at the artwork helping us appreciate the truth that is in scripture, uh, sometimes challenging the limited ways that we've understood things or even talked about things. So um, these images uh, are actually based on the Karo people of Ethiopia. It's in Southwest e Ethiopia near uh, Kenya. And you know, if humanity comes from an African origin around this area, who knows? Maybe Adam and Eve looked more like that uh, than uh, a suburban American couple uh, that we might know. Um, some of the artwork also is representing um, aboriginal um, clothing design. Uh, some of these are from South America and other indigenous artwork. And so again, privileging ancient culture in the presentation of Adam and Eve, you know, helps lift our sights uh, beyond a Western perspective. And humans are good and yet fallen and in need of redemption. And so the reminder of the serpent um, brings tension uh, that's in the biblical story 
even to the beauty with which we appreciate it. Well, um, with the fall comes labor and hardship and, and other challenges. Um, notice that uh, the thistle, the Welsh thistle, which is outside Donald Jackson's uh, uh, place of dwelling, is drawn in here as a way of describing the thorns and the thistles that are part of the fall. Um, but that's not the only part of the story. There's also a butterfly which lights and transcends even the prickly character of the thistle. And so the butterfly is also drawn in as a way of, of uh, representing the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, as well as angels. So also in volume one, uh, when you look at, um, the, uh, uh, at Jacob's ladder, angels ascending and descending, um, you see that as well as angels' wings, you have butterfly wings that are added to the angels' wings, you know, as kind of an artistic statement about the transcendence of human pain and misery. Well, moving on in volume one, uh, the Ten Commandments uh, show the different epochs of Israel's history, but then also God's word and its impact. This is a different artist. Uh, this artist makes art out of words. And so he also has done beautiful artwork on the Beatitudes uh, in Matthew chapter five, and also on the I Am sayings uh, in the Gospel of John. So again, different artistic approaches to great texts uh, have been rendered by different artists. And that's the kind of thing that you appreciate. Um, one resource that I might recommend and uh, would certainly encourage you know, faculty and administrators to, to get a hold of, of, of this volume. It's by uh, Susan Sink, The Art of the St. John's Bible. And it has images of, of nearly all of the paintings, but then it also has some history and explanation as to, as to how they were thinking about each of those images. So I encourage you to take a look at this uh, if you want to after our session. In fact, I can just kind of pass it around if you want to just leaf through it. Um, but it has great content and kind of describes, you know, the uh, interest of each of the, of, of the pieces of art. Well, at the end then of Deuteronomy, and so this is the last page in volume one, um, Moses is looking wistfully across to the promised land, is not allowed to enter, and notice that he is holding the commandments. Uh, uh, as a way of representing Moses and the Ten Commandments. Um, now, again, this piece of art is done by three different artists. You see that um, the Ten Commandments part, that's been done by the person who did the Ten Commandments artwork. Again, you know, uh, art out of words. Donald Jackson did the backdrop. But then we have another artist here who um, uh, is a specialist in Greek Orthodox uh, iconography. And so the face of Moses is done by, you know, an Orthodox uh, iconographer as a way of adding that uh, emphasis. So here, even um, the words of the Lord, uh, I have let you see it uh, with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Uh, again, one of those really unfair type themes uh, with, in, in uh, uh, Hebrew scripture. Um, I mean... What's Moses going to do? You know, he, he struck the rock earlier uh, there in Exodus, and water came forward. And God tells him, speak to the rock. And he's thinking, yeah, but it worked before. He strikes the rock instead of speaking to it. Water comes forth, huh. but he disobeyed the word of the Lord. I'm not sure what that suggests as we think about church growth strategies, but... Um, or, or other, you know, well-intentioned leadership approaches, but maybe it reminds us to listen to the present leading instead of simply relying on what's worked before. Um, the Joshua frontispiece then sees uh, uh, the, the uh, um, children of Israel crossing over into the promised land, and you can see images also of the Ten Commandments uh, going with them, and yet those commandments are broken as Israel, in, upon entering Canaan, uh, is challenged in her faithfulness. Well, moving on to the wisdom tradition. Here is um, Esther, 
um, who, as a Jewish woman, uh, is also uh, a queen in a, a neighboring nation uh, over toward the east, is that modern day Iran or some other part of Persia. Uh, and yet God uses the faithful person even in exile. Um, that's a message of great hope for later generations. Um, you also have some um, drawing in of celebrities and movie stars. And so um, when, when, when one of our artists at George Fox was talking about this particular image, um, he talked about this connecting with a particular movie star and, and how that it would also you know, echo the, the, the 20th century and our interest in celebrities. Well, the, the image uh, to the right here, uh, notice that uh, dangling from his own gallows is Naaman, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Haman, uh, who, uh, whose plot to kill the Jews was actually uh, discovered and he ends up being hanged on his own gallows. Um, it's, it's just a parenthetical reminder of some of these things that tend to happen uh, within the Esther story. Uh, how about Lady Wisdom? Uh, I was just outside uh, looking through this volume um, earlier today. And notice the way that this presentation of Lady Wisdom is like a mirror. And the lights around the mirror are the days of the lunar um, um, calendar. And as a mirror, we see our own reflection in looking at Lady Wisdom. And that applies, therefore, to men as well as women. Um, beautiful artwork in the story of Ruth and Naomi. Again, a different artist here. And notice the way that uh, Ruth's faithfulness to her mother-in-law uh, becomes the source of blessing in future generations. Moving on to other uh, presentations of women in the St. John's Bible, uh, we see the healings of Jesus in the synoptics. Uh, this is in Mark chapter five, uh, where um, uh, Jesus uh, performs um, the uh, uh, healing on the woman who touches his garment and then also uh, raises um, the girl from the dead. Um, in John 8, uh, the woman caught in adultery. Um, I call this the text caught in adultery in that it's, 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 it's not in the original manuscript of John. It's added in the second century but still a powerful story of redemption and grace. Um, notice the way that uh, even in, in the presentation that, that up here you have a closed curtain into the sanctuary of divine presence. And now in the lower image, um, that curtain is drawn aside and there's grace availed. The stones that people had are now on the ground and her accusers are no longer present. And so we see the movement from desolation to consolation, even in the face of the woman before the grace of Jesus. Again, I mean, th th this artwork really speaks powerfully the biblical message. It allows us to see things that we might not have caught otherwise. In that sense, artists are, are serving the role of biblical interpreters, and yet capturing the imagination of later audiences simply by the performance of the artwork. Well, in the Gospel of John, you have the post-resurrection um, account of Mary Magdalene. Um, she is the first one to um, behold the risen Lord. Notice in this presentation, the face of Jesus is not seen by the viewer, but the face of Jesus is reflected in the face of Mary and, by her, and on her hand. And so the radiance of the divine presence of Jesus here uh, is brought to us secondhand by the reflection on the hand and face of the Mary Magdalene. Again, a very striking image. And then she becomes then the apostle to the apostles as she goes and tells Peter and the others that she has seen the Lord. Um, other uh, presentations of, the, of women, and this is one of the interests of the St. John's Bible to feature women who are in the scriptures, um, are presented in other uh, um, uh, um, um, artistic renderings. Um, here we have a similarity of dress 
and yet we have two very, very different people. Um, in Luke chapter 7, uh, this is the woman who has been forgiven much and is much grateful. Uh, my thinking about that is that Luke changes a head anointing in Mark to a foot anointing. Um, Matthew follows Mark and has a head anointing. Uh, well, the Gospel of John has a foot anointing, and that makes me wonder if Luke might have access to John's tradition. Maybe Luke has heard John's material being rendered. Um, otherwise, Luke would probably stay with Mark. But for some reason, Luke departs from Mark and coincides with John. I also wonder if maybe Luke even hears the name Mary, uh, because it's Mary of Bethany, sister of Lazarus, uh, who anoints Jesus' feet. Um, Luke, right after this paragraph, in the next paragraph, brings in Mary Magdalene. And so um, that's one of the reasons that people associate Mary Magdalene with the woman who is sinful, although in Luke chapter 7, uh, that woman is not Mary Magdalene. And in chapter 8, where she is present, nothing is said about her being sinful. So maybe Luke's to blame for those myths about Mary Magdalene being a sinful woman. Uh, I mean, maybe she was a businesswoman, okay? And you look at Magdal, that's a big fishing village. Uh, maybe she was a sponsor of the Jesus movement. Maybe that was her notoriety. But um, we're, we're only guessing on those types of possibilities. Um, this woman over here, though, is the woman who rides on the beast in Revelation. And so there you have um, the redeemed and the unredeemed uh, also presented uh, in terms of their power. Well, looking at the calling of Abraham, um, notice the Jewish menorah, um, the candelabra that symbolizes um, the week between um, the lighting of the lamp and then the dedication of the temple uh, the following week. Um, it, it lasted for seven days even though there's only enough oil for one day. And so you have the Jewish menorah used as an image here for genealogy. And you have different tribes and God's promise to Abram um, that the earth will be blessed uh, by his uh, heredity. Um, you have then uh, in the book of Psalms, uh, you have five books of the Psalms um, your own Gerald Wilson did his great work on the Psalms, the five books of the Psalms. He was with us at George Fox before he came to Azusa. Well, uh, the way that they then um, uh, illuminate the book of Psalms, which, by the way, for the Benedictines, um, the, the Benedictine tradition reads the entire Psalms through the Psalms, uh, like every week. And they use this as a basis for worship. And so this is, in some ways, the central volume of the series. And they've also done like a menorah in terms of you know, a five-fold presentation here. Um, and then at each of the beginnings of those books, they have a feature of one of those particular candle pieces. And so it just makes a really nice introduction to the Psalms. Uh, Isaiah's vision in the temple. Again, um, a slight image can't do justice to the original uh, as you look at it out there. Um, in Ezekiel, um, that uh, the, the valley of the dry bones in Ezekiel 37. Well, think about a nation that has experienced um, decimation, uh, experienced its own holocaust. And then think about holocaust in our recent memory. As you look at the valley of dry bones today, uh, we see the holocaust uh, and genocide of the Jews in, in uh, Nazi Germany. Um, we also see, um, goodness, uh, Gulf War I, where all, you have all of those um, cars uh, trying to flee Ku Kuwait and try to get back into Iraq. And then they, of course, were prevented by American and Allied bombers. Well, you've, you've got the atrocities of war uh, presented here. And yet, believing that God also raises up um, valleys of dry bones today, uh, maybe there's hope yet. Um, how might God raise up, uh, you know, connect the knee bone to the thigh bone to the hip bone, like that wonderful Negro spiritual goes? And so, again, 
um, you know, making these biblical themes live in modern experience, you know, brings huge relevance uh, to the truth of Scripture, in my view. I mean, if you think about the Bible, it's not a safe book. Uh, it's provocative. It's prophetic. It calls for repentance. And yet it also brings hope. Well, you have then hope and messianic expectations. Um, your Lord comes to you uh, riding on a donkey, Zechariah. And then in Isaiah, uh, you have uh, hope for what God will be doing in the Messiah. Uh, Daniel 7, uh, you have the vision of the Son of Man. Uh, you have a presentation of the suffering servant. Uh, notice the Auschwitz rendering here of the suffering servant. And yet by his stripes, later generations are healed. Again, powerful imagery here. Uh, notice the lamb um, at, at the bottom here. Um, you have the lamb motif then developed in a variety of ways. Also associations with hunger and uh, with famine. So you think of the Horn of Africa and the kind of starvation issues going on there. Um, bring it into um, the Last Supper in Luke, uh, where uh, you, you, you have a transformation, you have a change between Mark and Luke. Mark says, this is the blood of my covenant poured out for you. Luke says, this is the cup of my covenant. You have a move towards a meal of remembrance. And yet in both cases, it's the blood of the lamb that becomes the healing of the nations. Um, again, it's, it's th this particular image is patterned after Andrei Rublev's um, classic work on the Trinity, where you actually have in some earlier representations, you have a lamb that is in the cup uh, as a striking association. Um, you have the lamb, um, the lamb's war in the book of Revelation, uh, who alone is worthy to open the seals uh, other visions of redemption that come true, therefore, in the New Testament. So moving on to the book of Matthew. Um, this is volume six. Uh, you have the genealogy of Jesus described here in powerful form. Again, here's the Jewish menorah and ways that it's tied into uh, the members of the ancestry. Um, in black, you have the Hebrew names. Uh, in gold, they are rendered in English. Um, an image, um, kind of a Middle Eastern image of spirituality and eternity, trying to make an interfaith statement. Uh, here we have Abraham and Sarah. Notice that Hagar is also mentioned and Hagar is the mother of Ishmael. An interesting feature here. Oh, Hagar's name is also written in Arabic as well as Hebrew, by the way. Um, an image of eternity and spirituality kind of as a stamp uh, that is used in various places. Um, notice the DNA double helix strand. Okay, of course, that's, that's Mary's side of the family. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it really is making a statement. This is a 21st century uh, contribution here. Moving on then to uh, Matthew 14. Here we have the calming of the storm. And this particular artist came and lectured for us at George Fox University last year. Again, the chaos is powerful, and yet the redemption is also um, serene and beautiful. Uh, the same artist then did um, a rendering of the Last Judgment <coughs> uh, where you have you know, even the glory part being two-thirds larger or twice as large as the first third. Um, moving on to in Matthew to chapter 16. Uh, this is very significant for the Catholic tradition of course where you have the confession of Peter um, here you have um, the face of Peter the Rock is rendered 
in cubism form. I think the artists have a bit of a sense of humor. You can see his jaw, his nose, Peter the Rock. And then Christ is gold. And so, again, conveying the divine presence. Upon this rock will I build my church. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. You are the Christ, the Messiah, Son of the living God, is Peter's confession. <clears throat> I should say that the biblical text that they used is the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, uh, the Catholic approved edition. So the Catholic approved notes then uh, have been hand, uh, you know, added by calligraphy um, in the margins. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Well, if you look at Caesarea Philippi, and Carla and I were there uh, a few years ago, um, it really is at the base of Mount Tabor. And this is where the Jordan River comes up right out of the ground. And about 100 yards away, there's a large cave that goes down into the depths of the earth. Maybe that's the association of the gates of Hades in terms of you know, an understanding of the, you know, of, of the netherworld. Um, as armies came through and as they conquered the region, uh, they would also set up shrines of worship to their gods. And so when you look around, there, there are a dozen different uh, pagan shrines honoring the gods of the conquering forces. So for Peter to be connected with that particular site as a place where he says, you are the Christ, son of the living God, you know, makes, makes a powerful statement against other claimants. Um, another, another point that is made, okay, so here you have the conquering horses uh, from Babylon or Assyria or elsewhere. But if you think of gates of Hades and human suffering today, um, what would that remind us of? Or what would remind us of that kind of suffering? Well, at the center here, how about a microscopic look at the AIDS virus? How's that for relevance? And you're also showing that the gates of Hades today uh, will not uh, overcome uh, the work of God in the world. So maybe there's hope even with such cataclysmic challenges in our generation. Moving on to the Gospel of Mark, beginning with John the Baptist. And here we have John kind of coming off the page toward the viewer. Um, images of the temple in Jerusalem. Notice the angels ascending and descending. Again, images from Jacob's ladder are associated here. Um, the light of the baptism of Jesus is showing on John's face. And notice the rendering of his hands and feet in graphic form. Um, you have little creatures up in the left. Uh, you have uh, red eyes and spiders. Well. He's taken out to the wilderness and tempted for 40 days along with the creatures and stuff. And so if you've had recent camping trips, um, this, this might be reminiscent. Um, and then Jesus and his presence uh, being baptized and then people, Jesus joining the mission of John the Baptist. Well, the sore and the soils, uh, different types of soils with different reception to the gospel. Again, when you look at um, the heritage edition, you'll see that each of these seeds is, is embossed gold. And they found a way to put them exactly in between the lines. So this did not happen by accident. Um, also on this particular page, there's an error. And here's where um, the little bird flies in the line and restores it. And, and you can also appreciate how the scribe might have made that error in that the last word, them, uh, is on both lines. So you can have a little sympathy uh, for the scribe. Mark 6, the feeding of the 5,000, the only miracle of Jesus in all four Gospels. And notice the amplitude of the feeding. And part of the message here is that we are called also to feed the multitudes in our day. And the black and the white lines represent sins of omission as well as sins of commission, inviting us to partner with Jesus in feeding the world. The transfiguration, here's Moses and Elijah. And again, the word from heaven, listen to him, which is then echoed elsewhere in the text. 
um, sometimes um, marginal texts are included. And so just as a way of you know, reminding us of important themes in the gospel narrative. Uh, here is, again, the image of the resurrection at the end of Mark. Um, for Christmas greetings, um, yeah, uh, again, powerful new artwork uh, that's from the frontispiece of Luke. Glory to God in the highest heaven. And the angels and also the image of, of revelation present like a cross image. So you, so you can see that um, the image from heaven coming down to like an altar instead of a cradle. And then the, the angels make a cross sign even at the birth of Jesus. So peace among those whom he favors. Um, here you have Mary and Joseph and the babe and the wise men and women coming from the east. Uh, again, the lamb is associated with the sacrificial image. Um, the bull here is, again, reminiscent of cave art, um, the, the cave art uh, from France that was discovered a few years ago. The mercy of the Lord, giving light to those who sit in darkness, again, illuminating the world by the truth of revelation. Then when you look at the... Uh, choruses in the book of, of Luke. Um, this is actually worship material from early Christians. And so they've rendered this also in artistic form. And you can buy those as greeting cards, by the way, or as artwork uh, on the St. John's website. Simeon's song, again, beautiful material here. Well, moving on in Luke, uh, you have Jesus with Mary and Martha. And here Martha has her hands on her hips in ways that represent a bit of industrious impatience for which we are greatly thankful. Here also is the woman who anoints Jesus in Luke. Um, this is the, um, uh, the anthology of five parables in Luke. Um, you have the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Um, well, if the theme of the lost son is, is forgiveness, how about throwing in a couple of twin towers? I, I wrote an essay on this for Huffington Post and, and posted it uh, before 9-11, a couple of years ago. I mean, th this is really convicting, uh, even for our audiences today. Again, it doesn't show up a whole lot, but you, if you see over here, over on the left, on the right side, you see that two towers have been added. And notice that there is gold on those twin towers. As tragic and terrible as those events have been, uh, still there's the capacity for God's truth to prevail. Moving on to the crucifixion, notice that the cross of Jesus is almost totally gold, despite the tragedy that that was. And yet it's formed after the hero crucifixion in Köln, in Germany, which shows Christ hanging in anguish instead of a beautiful form. The last words of Jesus on Golgotha are then echoed in the Road to Emmaus story. Um, notice that the two uh, men do not recognize Jesus at first, but later they recognize him in the breaking of the bread. Uh, again, um, to catch a sense of the divine presence around table fellowship, I think it's a sacramental message for today as well. Um, we need to have more coffee with one another, more meals together. And in doing so, can we open our eyes to God's presence being there? After all, Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in your midst. Notice, however, this is the artwork that is on the St. John's Bible um, CD, um, notice that the face of Christ is very different in the volume that we had at George Fox. You might look at the one that you have here. Uh, I've not looked at it. But notice that the face of Jesus is clearer in post-resurrection consciousness than it is on the cross. 
Um, to me, that's a powerful message. That sometimes we see Christ more clearly in his presence with one another than we might in archaeology or in actual history. Well, the incarnation of the word, they struggled most with this particular image. How do you render the word made flesh in artistic form? Um, if we get it right, it becomes the key for understanding the rest of scripture. The incarnate word is the key to the written word. And what they've done is to throw in another Christological hymn alongside John 1, 1 to 18. And so this passage from Colossians 1, firstborn of creation, now the head of the church, reminds us of the worship of early Christians. John's testimony to Jesus, behold the Lamb of God, continues on in powerful ways. Uh, if you've seen The Last Temptation of Christ, the movie, and I don't recommend it, um, one review that I read in Britain says, Yes, we know that Jesus came to show us who God was, but does he, does he really have to come to us in the form of a Californian teenager with an identity complex? <laughs> um, other thoughts or ways that this speaks to you or questions about how to make use of it? Or Yes, um, the point is that um, this rendering of the Bible's truth um, does great service towards diversity. And, and some, some of the essays that I'm working on, and so I, I'm, I'm working on several themes. Uh, one theme is um, presentation of women in the St. John's Bible. Uh, maybe another category would be, uh, you know, aspects of diversity coming from the St. John's Bible. You bet, yeah. And, and uh, yeah, um, interfaith appreciation of God's work in the world. Um, something else that I'll do is on the spirituality of the St. John's Bible. And so, yeah, re re really. Um, I'm, I'm going to be gathering some of them into an essay that will be a part of a book. Um, and who knows? I mean, depends on how many I get done. <laughs> That's a great idea, though. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let's be in touch. Send me an email. You bet. <laughs> uh, d tell me your name. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you, Maria. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Other <laughs> thoughts? Yes. Um, I think that what they did, I mean, they spent two whole years just laying out the, the text, okay, on computer. And they spent three years besides that thinking about which art to include. They did make use of theologians and biblical scholars and asked, okay, what's really important here as we think about these texts? So w one question is, wh which subjects should we have an art piece done on? Then another question is, who would do it and what shall we emphasize? And, and they really worked collaboratively and they would send stuff back and forth. And I heard one story of an artist who, who um, th th this, uh, this was Suzanne Moore, that came to us at George Fox, and, and, and she had like two or three different renderings of a particular art piece, and she's in contact with Donald Jackson saying, you know, I'm not sure if any of these are any good. You know, what do you think? I say, well, send them all to us, and, and, and we'll hammer on the issue. And so they, they, they selected one of her artistic pieces. Yeah, let's go with that one. And so they, they, they collaborated with each other and even made suggestions. Um, one thing that they completely left out was to include a featuring of the Lord's Prayer. Can you believe that? And as Donald Jackson was, was doing the calligraphy for the Gospel of Matthew, he gets to, gets to Matthew chapter 6 and says to himself, my goodness, we don't have the Lord's Prayer featured. <laughs> and so he made a modification that we've got to find a way to add the Lord's Prayer here. And so he created some space in some way, I'm not sure, but then added the Lord's Prayer. Um, so something that, that's kind of interesting also, um, what, when, when you look at some of the pages, and so look at the, the stilling of the storm in Matthew 14, as Suzanne Moore, uh, the artist who did like the um, sea crossing storm, um, as, as she was looking at the other side, there's a dragonfly on the, on the, on the next page, and the dragonfly is kind of off the page, and it's, and, and it's bleeding through in translucence. And so she's thinking, oh my goodness, how do we cover that up? 
And so she expanded the storm and then the stillness after the storm to include the full page, even a little cross down at the bottom, which then covers up the dragonfly on the other side. <laughs> and so just you know, some of the things you can't anticipate um, you know, made their way into the presentation itself. Um, that's a great question. Um, the question is whether there are liberal arts institutions who use the St. John's Bible in an interdisciplinary way, using art, history, Bible, theology, contemporary issues. I'm not aware of any. Maybe Azusa Pacific should be the first, if the Lord leads. I think that would be a great project. We, 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 we've done a little bit of that uh, at George Fox, but just on the level of like um, me and an art teacher doing a presentation or Howard Macy, uh, Old Testament scholar, and an art teacher doing another presentation. So, so we've done joint lectures, but we haven't really designed courses, but, but that could be a really nice capstone kind of a course, or maybe even an introductory. Freshman year, Freshman year seminar, you bet. Yeah, why not get, get people thinking about things creatively from day one? Yeah, thank you, I love it. Any other thoughts? Well, Kenneth, I think we've had a wonderful time, and uh, thank you for having me and for a wonderful chance to engage the St. John's Bible. John, great to be with you, and, and blessings, and uh, come see us at George Fox. <laughs>